The two intermediaries through whom the Guardian's then editor, Peter Preston, claims Fyde had contacted him are the Liberal Democrats Peer and Barrister, Lord Anthony Lester QC, who worked for Fyde, and the Guardian's then chairman, Hugo Young, who died in 2003. During Neil Hamilton's 1999 libel trial against Fyde, Hamilton's counsel Desmond Brown QC asked Peter Preston as to how Fyde had got in touch with him. Desmond Brown put it to him, Lord Lester had contacted your colleague Hugo Young and said that Mr Fyred wanted to speak to you? Preston replied, No, that is not the case. He said he wanted to speak to somebody from The Guardian. I went back to Lord Lester and said, Who does he want to speak to? A reporter or whatever? And he went back, I think, to Harrods and came back with the, in my view, not entirely wonderful news that he wanted to speak to me. Brown confirmed, that's Mr. Fyred wanted to speak to you? Preston responded, yes. Brown asked, when you say Lord Lester went back to Harrods, you mean went back to Mr. Fyred? Preston said, I assume so. The message was he wanted to see somebody from The Guardian because he thought he could be helpful with the Saudi case. The Saudi case to which Preston refers here is the Guardian story of a week earlier alleging that the Saudi ambassador to Washington, Prince Bandar, had given £7 million to the Conservative Party. Preston continued, It was not specified whether he wanted to see a reporter or whatever. I went back and said, Who is looking for it? Because I was particularly anxious about the Saudi case. He said he wanted to see me, so I went along. Proving as we have that this account is a complete concoction, it's interesting to see how Preston embellishes it with seemingly authentic detailed clarifications. His description of all the toing and froing sounds so plausible, and one can visualise it happening the way he describes. But then Desmond Brown asks him, So Mr Fyde approached the Guardian, not the other way round. We can agree that? Preston replied, Lord Lester approached the Guardian, yes. Brown asked him, on Mr Fyde's behalf. Now, this is a particularly innocuous question, and if Preston's story was true, it ought not to have caused him the slightest difficulty. However, he was completely stumped for words. Preston replied, I have no, I have not talked to Anthony Lester about this at all. The notion that Peter Preston wouldn't have spoken at length to the man who supposedly phoned The Guardian, and who, as we shall see, even writes for The Guardian, is simply not credible. But knowing the facts as we do, it's clear Preston didn't wish to involve Anthony Lester any more than was necessary. Indeed, looking back at Preston's various accounts over the years, it's clear he's tried to keep both Anthony Lester and Hugo Young right out of it, right from the very start. For instance, the first time Preston described how he came to meet Fyde was in his article on Fyde's motivation, published on October the 21st, 1994. In this, he states, I have known him on and off for 15 months. Last summer, when The Guardian was in the toils of a Middle Eastern saga, an intermediary said that he was interested and would try to help if wanted. There is simply no cogent reason for Preston to refrain from saying who this intermediary was. Then, eight months later, in June 1995, he signed his witness statement for the first action. And as we've already seen in the previous chapter, Preston still couldn't bring himself to disclose who the intermediary was. He states, In late June 1993, I was contacted by Mohammed Al-Fayed via intermediaries. A few months later, in October 1996, following the collapse of the trial, Peter Preston put pen to paper again. This time, he said, It began a long time ago and almost by accident. The Guardian had published a story about Saudi funding of the Conservative Party. Deep, instantly swirling waters. Hugo Young, the chairman of the Scott Trust, that's the unique body that owns the Guardian, phoned me. A senior QC friend had called, saying Mohammed Al-Fayed thought he might be able to assist. Would I like to go along and see? So it took nearly two years for Preston to disclose 
that it was actually his close colleague Hugo Young who supposedly received the call. But we're still left wondering, for absolutely no good reason, who the QC friend was who supposedly made the call. In fact, it wasn't until January 1997 that Guardian journalist David Lee then let the cat out of the bag in his book of the affair, Sleaze. In describing what supposedly had happened following the publication of the article alleging the Saudi funding of the Conservative Party, Lee states, The next morning there was a call from Hugo Young, the Guardian's chief political columnist and chairman of the Scott Trust, which owns and guards the paper. He had been contacted by Anthony Lester QC, Lord Lester of Hernhill, the Liberal peer who specialises in European human rights. Leicester had the Strasbourg case for Mohammed Al-Fayed on the stocks. The owner of Harrods, said Young, seemed pretty excited about the Saudi tale. If you want any help, he's ready to talk. So, with both Hugo Young and Anthony Leicester now finally on the record as the two middlemen, in his 1999 witness statement, Peter Preston actually got around to naming them himself. It had taken him nearly five years to do so since his first article in which he described how the affair had begun. He states, In late June 1993, I was defending a story which The Guardian had published about Saudi funding of the Conservative Party general election campaign in 1992. I was contacted by Hugo Young, then as now the chairman of the board of trustees of The Guardian, who told me that he had received a call from Lord Lester QC, then acting for Mohammed Al-Fayed in an application to the European Court of Human Rights. Apparently, Lord Lester had suggested that Mr Al-Fayed had information which would assist The Guardian and asked me to contact Mr Al-Fayed. Given the proven falsity of this account, it is perhaps not surprising that Preston felt the need to insert the otherwise gratuitous word, apparently, prior to describing Lord Leicester's role. Preston's unnatural shyness in naming the two intermediaries confirms further his perjury on this issue to add to the others we've already proved. However, the two intermediaries themselves clearly decided that for them, Perjury is not an option. As told by Preston under oath, Lord Anthony Lester and Hugo Young both had pivotal roles in an amazing story. A story that went on to win The Guardian international fame. Both wrote for The Guardian too, so it is hugely telling that neither have written a single word about their roles, still less signed witness statements to support The Guardian's version of events. We'll deal first with Lord Anthony Lester. We recall in Chapter 4 how Fyatt had tried to overturn the 1990 DTI report in the European Court of Human Rights. Well, Lester was Fyatt's counsel in that action and he most likely retains friendly relations with him. And, as we've said, he also writes for The Guardian. So given the straits in which both Fyatt and The Guardian had got themselves, Lester's silence is particularly conspicuous. After all, it's not as if he's a shy or retiring character. For example, despite his huge conflict of interest, in November 1994, The Guardian carried an article by him arguing that Neil Hamilton's libel action against the paper was misguided in law. Three months later, he really stirred things up when he submitted a memo to a House of Lords inquiry alleging that four peers were taking bribes to table questions. On February 4th, 1995, The Guardian's Patrick Wintour reported, The trail of political sleaze spread from the Commons to the House of Lords yesterday when the eminent Liberal Democrats lawyer, Lord Lester, alleged in secret evidence to a Lords committee that four peers had taken substantial sums for putting questions to ministers. Lord Leicester, Queen's Counsel, gives his evidence in a memorandum to a new Lords Committee set up to decide whether peers should join MPs in setting up a register of interests. His allegations, coming in the midst of the Nolan inquiry into standards in public life, shocked peers who assumed their colleagues were entirely innocent of any taint of corruption. Lord Leicester does not name the four peers. Lord Leicester also declined last night to name his client. 
But the suspicion at Westminster began to centre on Mohammed Al Fayed, the owner of Harrods and the man behind the allegations that led to the ministerial resignations of Neil Hamilton and Tim Smith last year. In this week's Spectator magazine, Mr Al Fayed, who has become a leading tormentor of the British establishment, says that Lord Leicester is wise and fair-minded, as befits a council of mine. Overleaf, the Guardian carried his profile, together with a reprint of his memo, in which he'd remarked, The fact that peers do not receive a salary may well make them more vulnerable. Their lordships were not amused. Having failed to supply any evidence to support his client's charges, the following Thursday Anthony Lester was obliged to read out a statement of apology from the floor of the House. And his fortitude remained undiminished a decade later. In April 2005, the Daily Mail reported that Lord Leicester had accused the government of conducting a cover-up in order to frustrate his efforts to prove that Tony Blair had lied about when he and President Bush had agreed to the invasion of Iraq. A few months later in August, the then Conservative leader Michael Howard, himself a barrister, accused some judges of frustrating Britain's anti-terror laws. Four days later, Lord Leicester responded in The Observer by denouncing Michael Howard for making intemperate and ignorant attacks on the judiciary. So, having besmirched the reputations of his colleagues in the House of Lords and the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, Anthony Leicester has shown that he is certainly no shrinking violet. Yet despite the weight that his status as an eminent human rights barrister would bring to confirming the Guardian's account, and despite his amiable relations with that newspaper, he has never signed a witness statement to support it. Which is very odd indeed, especially when one considers that in November 2000, from the floor of the House of Lords, he described the other intermediary, Hugo Young, as... An old and very close friend of mine. So surely then, Lord Leicester would certainly have been disposed to help out his very close friend, whose uninsured newspaper, remember, stood to lose more than £10 million over the destruction of Ian Greer's lobbying business. However, he didn't lift a finger. But if anything, the late Hugo Young's behaviour is even more telling than Anthony Leicester's. As we reminded ourselves in the previous chapter, a few days before The Guardian began investigating Ian Greer, Young had penned an essay complaining that British public life was being corrupted by a growing army of power-peddling PR consultants and lobbyists whom the world would be better off without. And yet, despite this passionate disdain of lobbyists, Hugo Young has kept as quiet as a mouse. For example, in the very issue that carried Preston and Henke's original Cash for Questions article, Hugo Young discussed a referendum on a European treaty. Five days later, with Cash for Questions still going strong, Young then penned an article about an outfit called the Social Justice Commission. Two years later, when Neil Hamilton and Ian Gray settled their libel actions, The Guardian ran riots with acres of coverage implying that this most talked-about lobbyist had corrupted the entire Conservative Party. However, despite Hugo Young's own keen interest in lobbying, and despite his role in the story, Young passed up the opportunity to comment and instead penned three articles on the Labour Party. Likewise, when Downey published his report another nine months later in July 1997, The Guardian responded with a front-page lead and an eight-page pull-out, again putting Ian Greer at the heart of the affair. It included a piece by David Henke describing how the paper's investigation had supposedly begun. But in this very same issue, the best-placed man to write that story, Hugo Young, instead chose to write a piece about... America's relations with China. 
But when, a year later, the Observer published a story implying that Labour lobbyist Derek Draper held sway over new Prime Minister Tony Blair's advisers, Hugo Young was back on his hobby horse as quick as a flash, venting his spleen about the new political class of advisers and consultants and bagmen with a line to new Labour's soul. Sometimes silence really is more damning than a lie. It is precisely Hugo Young's unnatural silence, together with the mountain of interlocking evidence we've discussed in chapters 7, 8, 24, and now this one, which shows that it was, in fact, Hugo Young who had solicited fired help through his old friend, Lord Leicester QC. Not fired who'd asked his QC, of all people, to phone the Guardian offering his help for no particular reason. And Young's denunciation of lobbyists, only a few days before he put in the call, shows it was this that had motivated him to make it. Clearly, he and Peter Preston felt that Ian Greer was one lobbyist who should be got rid of, and his old friend Anthony Lester was someone he called on to persuade Fired to help them do the job. So, with a veritable mass of solid, diverse, fully integrating evidence, we have proved that the most fundamental, most universally accepted aspect of the Guardian story is a whopping lie. We've proved that the affair was not provoked by Fired at all. Instead, we've shown that the paper's journalists had embarked on their own investigation on their own accord, and that their investigation concerned not cash for questions, but rather their long-standing suspicions about Ian Greer and his commission payments. However, The Guardian produced several documents in order to prove that Fired had made cash for questions allegations, and had done so at the outset, and that that's what Henke and Mullen's investigation was all about. In chapters 26 to 34 coming next, we will examine these documents one by one, and air more evidence exposing them even further as the forgeries and misrepresentations that they are.